Norman, thanks for being here. It's great to have you at our thank Center you. for Middle East Studies. Thank you. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask you about is Iran. You've spent some time in Iran over the last couple of years, and I understand you taught a course there um, and taught John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I'm quite fascinated by that as someone who's written about Iran and specifically about um, the engagement in Iran with European um, political ideas and, um, and liberal uh, thinkers. Um, I'm quite curious. Tell, me, tell us about your experience in Iran. Well, first of all, it was very narrow. I was there for two weeks and um, I did not have exposure to all segments of Iranian society. I was invited by, uh, informally by a couple of people who are clearly uh, critical of Rouhani, and although they did not have, there was no love lost between them and uh, the former uh, Prime Minister Ahmadinejad, they, were sim they clearly were in his camp for a long period of time. And it was a very full schedule, but it was limited to that part of Iran that they were, uh, that they, that they frequented, um, which was fine by me because the Western-oriented Iranians I could see any time in New York, I was much more interested in the ones who were not oriented towards the West. And that was true of the teaching experience also. Uh, University of Tehran, where I did not teach, they said that probably four of every five students there, all he or she wants is to get a green card and come to the United States. Uh, the people I was with, uh, I, w I taught at Imam Sadiq University, which is basically a gateway to government positions. And um, the students were very smart, for sure. This was for one semester? No, no, just for a few days. I was only there two weeks in March. Mm. I think it's March. We're in April now? Yeah, right. March. I was only there two weeks in March. Um, they were very smart, uh, clever, for sure. Uh, and I would say the main concern of theirs, as we were looking at Mill, is there's a kind of defensiveness about Islam. There is a sense that any Western book must in some way be uh, trying, must in some way undermine Islam. And so there was, at the beginning, a certain amount of tension with students, I think, trying to defend against an enemy that wasn't really at the gate. Um, <laughs> Right. I said the questions that Mill raises come up in any society, regardless of whether or not it's um, uh, Islamic. It's just questions of where do you draw the line? At what point does government interference become uh, unacceptable? At what point does the individual, does the state have the right to restrict or limit individual liberty? And different societies may draw it in different places, but that's just a problem in any society. It has nothing particular to do with Iran, uh, with Islam. Uh, but once we got over that particular obstacle, uh, it was a very satisfying teaching experience, I thought. Good. And, and it's interesting because there's a long history of engagement in Iranian intellectual life with yeah. thinkers like Mill, um, Hannah Arendt is very yeah. popular in Iran today, Isaiah Berlin, uh, Jürgen Habermas, Karl Popper, you know, and going back, even in uh, the city of Qom, where the seminaries uh, are mostly located, there's a long tradition of engagement with Nietzsche and Heidegger, including amongst very conservative uh, religious scholars. Well, I was in Qom for, uh, I spent a day there. Uh, there were definitely, the religious scholars were definitely very smart and very serious. It was kind of Plato's Republic, and this is the guardian of Philosopher Kings, the guardians. Right. And um, you had a sense there that these people uh, took ideas very seriously. Right. And you can have a good conversation with them. 
the students were very impressive. You know, there are people, there are young people there, they commit themselves to four, five, seven years of seminary. And uh, it's very rigorous. It's, I asked them about that. I was curious myself. And they said it's as rigorous as you decide to make it. Yeah. Um, one fellow, his father is uh, in the foreign ministry, a really delightful person. And his son is a seminarian there. And it was a long drive. We drove from um, uh, Tehran to Qum. And uh, he mentioned that he doesn't own a cell phone. I said, well, that's a coincidence. I think we're probably the last two people <laughs> on earth. And I asked, why um, don't you own a cell phone? And he says, why do you need a cell phone? All it enables you to do is to talk to people horizontally all around you, whereas if you read a book, you can have a direct connection to God. And I thought that was pretty impressive. I, you don't hear young people saying things like that. Uh, it yeah. was a very, for me, it was a special moment. Yeah, when I was in Qom, I met with uh, professors at one of the most conservative theological institutions in that city, which is the most conservative city in Iran. Actually, they say al Mashad is the most conservative. Fair enough. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> good point. In some ways, actually, Qom is quite cosmopolitan, yeah, ironically, I, I because, so. well, you have, it's a mecca of sorts for Shia scholars and seminarians from all over the Shia world. And so there are people from all all sorts of countries in Qom. It makes it a very international. There were several from the UK. Yeah. There were several young UK young people who decided to do it. Um, Absolutely. I'm trying to remember if there was or there wasn't an American there. No, well, I, I met an American yeah. in Qom. Uh, he was a professor at the Imam Khomeini Institute, um, which, as you I may know, I think I was there. Okay. Yeah. So you might know that the. Um, the director of the Imam Khomeini Institute is actually Ayatollah Mesba Yazdi, who is considered the most right-wing, um, some would say proto-fascist mm -hmm. uh, Ayatollah in all of Iran. Now, I happened to meet four professors from that institute. They met with a group of uh, Americans. It was an interfaith delegation that I was on. And one of the professors was an American by the name of Mohammed Legenhausen who has a New York accent very much like yours. And his, his original name was Gary Lagenhausen. He went to Iran, he converted to Shiism in the early 1980s, went to Iran, has been there ever since. And he teaches philosophy, he's a philosophy professor. And I had dinner with him. I said, so give me an example of a philosophy course you teach. He said, well, right now I'm teaching modern political theory. I said, really interesting, what, do you, what texts are you using? He said, I teach Rawls, Marx, and feminism. I said, really? So this is the most conservative institution in Qom. The, you're training seminarians, and you're teaching Marx and Rawls and feminism. I said, are you teaching them as cannon fodder? He said, just the opposite. I teach them sympathetically. Not because I want the students to accept these ideas, but because when they reject them, I want them to understand precisely what it is they're rejecting. I want them to get deep inside these ideas. And so I play devil's advocate in class and I teach these thinkers sympathetically. I've told that story to many friends since, Iranian and non-Iranian. And all of my non-Iranian friends are shocked by that, that that's happening in Qom. All of my Iranian friends, even my most ardent, atheist, liberal, anti-Islamic Republic Iranian friends all say, yeah, that's Qom. That's been going on for centuries there. That's just the culture of Qom. It sounds like that resonates a bit with your own experience. Yeah, because uh, actually, Professor Chomsky, whenever he wants to ridicule Western intellectuals, he always makes the comparison, the disparaging comparison, and says, these people are as crazy as the mullahs in Qum. <laughs> and when I came back, I said, you know, that's... Uh, not right. It's unfair to the to the mullahs. The mullah, uh, Qum was by far the most uh, sober place I visited in Iran. The questions were always pointed, no rhetoric, no slogans. Uh, they were very shrewd, and they took ideas very seriously. 
So I said, no, they're not. The mullahs of Qum happen to be <laughs> the best of the bunch, and they're smart. One final question about your experience in Iran. Why did you select John Stuart Mills on liberty in you know, particular? I had no ulterior motive. I like to teach that. Uh, I like to teach it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, really a solid piece of work, and it's always provoking. Uh, so it wasn't like I was coming there to teach them the virtues of liberty, uh, or freedom of thought. I just like to teach that uh, particular work. Right. Um, and uh, I thought it was pretty successful. It was only that class was an intensive class for three days. Uh, I wish it had gone on longer. It was striking to me, everybody knew I was Jewish, but nobody cared at all. Mm. Uh, I ran this Jewish thing, it operates on two levels. At the level of abstraction or generality, they think the Jews control the world. Everybody does there. It's really kind of odd. I met with the uh, head of the American, uh, American division in the foreign ministry, and he thinks that Jews get together at this Bilderberg conference every year and decide everything in the world. They do. But when you get down to concrete Jews as against the Jews who control right. the world and the universe for that matter. When you get down to concrete Jews, they have no interest at all. There's no animus, there's no, uh, there's no philo-Semitism, there's no anti-Semitism, there's nothing. Uh, what they're concerned about is Islam. If I had come in and I was not Jewish and I was Buddhist, Christian, uh, 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 any religion, they would have reacted the same way to me. And so, to give one illustration, when I completed the little course, we called it a mini course, when I completed it, uh, I was sitting in a little room having tea with some people, and the students were milling around outside, and sort of sheepishly, one of them came over and said, we have a question we want to ask you. And from my experiences elsewhere, here's the question about Oh, well, as a Jew, how can you be against Israel, or something of that sort? And the question was, do you believe in an afterlife? See, that was what concerned them, hmm. whether I, how I related to being, how I related to being, to the Islamic religion. Do I believe in an afterlife? They, has, they had no interest at all in me as being a Jew. There was, to my, to my, uh, feeling there was, there was no anti-Semitism there. There is this kind of crazed view of the world whereby Jews control everything, which is something different. I wouldn't call it anti-Semitism. I'm not quite sure what I would call it. I would call it there's a large component of craziness there. It's but conspiratorial that, and paranoid. Yeah, conspiratorial, paranoid, but I think most societies, if that proverbial Martian were to come down, <laughs> uh, the extraterrestrial, uh, he, he or she or it would find as much craziness and paranoia in American society as he would in, as it would in Iran. It just takes different forms. Right, and I would add to that that the conspir the, the tendency towards conspiratorial approaches mm -hmm. in Iran is not limited to Jews or the Jews. Mm -hmm it's actually more pervasive than that. There are most of the conspiracy theories in Iranian po political culture are to do with the British and the Americans. Yeah, and before that, if you go back, it, sure it was the Russians. Yeah, it was I'm the sure great powers. True. In fact, Ervand Abrahamian, the great mm -hmm. Iranian mm -hmm. Marxist historian mm -hmm. and political scientist, has an essay on this exact point called The Paranoid Style in Iranian Politics. Right. Well, you know, it's, you know the, the cliche, uh, even paranoids have enemies, <laughs> and there is, a, there is more than a kernel of truth in these conspiracy theories. The, the problem is how you, uh, how you um, situate the realities of plots and conspiracies within the bigger picture, uh, and then it becomes kind of complicated how you do that. Uh, oddly enough, Professor Chomsky is often accused of being a conspiracy theorist, uh, but if you look at his, the things he said over a long period of time, 
He's actually very unconspiracy theorist in his views. So, for example, I've known him for many years. I've known him for now three decades. And where many people thought, for example, the Rosenbergs, the atomic, so-called, they weren't, but the so-called atomic spies, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, whereas many people on the left thought that they were innocent, he said, I think they were guilty. And he was right. I mean, it turned out he was right. right. Um, on the question of um, the JFK, uh, Chomsky has always been a Lee Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, he, he has very little truck with the conspiracy theories. Right. Um, so uh, I think these are difficult uh, questions, uh, though clearly the, the Iranians uh, that I met, that I met, have clearly crossed any rational boundary and are making statements which are just so completely crazy about how American politics works. And um, I did my best to disabuse them of some of those notions. I have to say, they gave me completely free, uh, they were, let me say what I wanted. I was on three national television programs, each for an hour, hmm. one maybe for an hour and a half, but maybe it was an hour. Three programs which had large listenerships. Uh, they did not prevent me from saying anything. Now, it's true they didn't ask me certain questions. For example, they didn't ask me any question about Syria. Uh, but on the questions which they did ask me, including on the Nazi Holocaust, on the role of the Jews in uh, American society, and so on and so forth, I was very firm in uh, telling them they were wrong. And the only place I had some problems uh, was in Al Mashad where we had a community meeting, it was about 300 people from the community, who were, uh, many of whom were very emphatic that the Nazi Holocaust didn't happen. I was equally emphatic that it did happen. And they kept, they were very persistent, which I understand to be an Iranian or Persian characteristic, the stubbornness. The more you say it didn't, it did, the more they say it didn't. And finally I said, I said folks, there are only two countries on earth that I know of that are so obsessed by the Nazi Holocaust, Israel and yourself. <laughs> I said, maybe Iran has more in common with Israel than you realize. Actually, others have pointed that out. I said, folks, it happened. It was horrible. You had nothing to do with it. Now let's move on. Right. <laughs> it's just right. that simple. Yes. And then we got into an argument about the numbers, because now they want to prove to me it's two million and not six million. It's okay. On that point, um, for those who think that Holocaust denial is a pervasive aspect of Iranian life today, mm -hmm. the truth is that when President Ahmadinejad organized that Holocaust conference, mm -hmm. at which David Duke was infamously present, um, there were many Iranian intellectuals and journalists and academics who wrote an open letter protesting this, saying this is embarrassing, this is... In fact, even Mohammed Legenhausen, who I mentioned earlier, a professor at the most conservative theological seminary in Qom, actually said in front of us, a group of Americans and his colleagues, he said, to me, this was a huge disgrace and an embarrassment that we organized this. He tried to stop it. He said, look, these people don't even know who David Duke is. They don't realize what no, a don't. racist he is. And they so my point simply is that there is actually quite a bit of debate in Iran about this Holocaust denial. What gets headlines in the West is the Holocaust denial, the conferences, the outrageous statements. Well, I'm, of, I'm invited to those conferences every year, and it's a real struggle to tell them, to, to be emphatic that I'm not going to attend. I got, I guess, a kind of, you would call it um, a, a, a dubious compliment of being told I was the most important <laughs> Western intellectual to visit Iran since David Duke. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> and how did you respond to that? That's a tricky one. It's not so much that it's tricky, it's the country has been closed off for 30 years, right. so it just has very strange notions. It thinks David Nuke is a leading Western intellectual. They think Robert Forisson is an authority in the Nazi Holocaust. They do. You know, that's just, it's a fact. 
Uh, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate because you're, you're, you're really disconnected from the, the real world. There are people I met who uh, are sympathetic to the revolution, uh, sympathetic to the constitution, so it's not the pro-Western crowd within um, the parameters of those who support the revolution who are very knowledgeable and very intelligent. Uh, and they told me, though, that they're marginalized. That is, you're allowed to say anything you want on unimportant things. Right. But the, mo the moment you touch the significant issues, for right. example, the uh, fallibility of the supreme leader, then That's a you can't line. say it. Yeah, it's a red line. Uh, but even within the, what well, you can call, roughly speaking, the pro is the pro-revolution camp, and its numbers differ. The, the figures I heard from the side I heard from uh, was that you know 60 percent support the revolution, 40 percent don't. Uh, of the 60 percent that do, there's a hardcore of about 20 or 30 percent who really support it, as in we're going to give our life for it. And then, of course, it starts gray areas right. start to set in. Uh, I don't know, but it's clearly divided. Uh, but I found within the camp that supports it, people who I trusted. Uh, people, I'm pretty good at sizing people up, and I can tell who is intellectually clear-headed and who is operating in, a, uh, in the bubble. Right. I met the people. Uh, I, I can't say that they were happy there. I, I was just saying that um, I can't say the fellow was happy there. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, he f I, I asked him things about the Constitution and whether you can reconcile it with democratic, basic democratic principles. Can you work it? And he said, you know, some aspects yes, some aspects no. Um, the question is whether you can find a way in that society to work out a reasonable uh, kind of system. And I have no idea of the answer to that. Well, Norman, thanks very much for mm -hmm. this chat. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.